Okay, thank you. Well, welcome to Apache Nine Five One Hundred One. I'm going to attempt to keep this at the uh, 101 introductory level. I'm a dev advocate at Stream Native. I used to be at Cloudera, where I did a lot of NiFi. I do more Pulsar and Flink now, but uh, uh, as you'll see, NiFi has a lot of uh, places where it works pretty well. I'll just skip through some of this. Uh, what's nice is I'll show you some examples of why I like NiFi maybe over Camel, just the ease of connecting two different things. And especially other Apache projects are very well integrated. So if I want to integrate with Kafka or Pulsar or Flink or Spark, ton of different things there. This is what a typical flow looks like. It's a little uh, prettier in the UI. What's nice for NiFi verse Camel, Mule, and most of the other ones is what you see is what you get. It is WYSIWYG, ETL, ELT, data tools. Uh, the nice thing is you start off by running a single Docker container or running a small instance on a, a laptop, running on uh, you know a little Jetson or something. You get a lot done in a single user you know, portfolio here. But what's different from, say, a lot of these other frameworks or tools out there is you know, you're not limited to one node. It is really designed to scale out as big as you need to. Uh, what's unique about NiFi is it came, by the time it made it to Apache, it had already been a very mature product and a little different from most of the uh, open source integration tools out there. It was a tool developed at the NSA so that they could acquire data from a lot of different things. But they had some requirements a little different from most enterprises in that they wanted to be able to start, stop things, change things on the fly, have an operator go, hey, that system is no longer online or you know, it crossed a intercontinental barrier and you can't access anymore. Go somewhere else, do something else and not losing data and knowing exactly what happened at every step of the way with an insane amount of auditing were things that were required from the start and the ability to start from one node and go to a hundred, you know, without uh, any issues in scaling. So you get that easy to use and set up, run uh, one instance on your laptop and support a lot of uh, power to expand out to be, you know, billions of events a second, you know, without changing anything. Uh, there is a version out there that runs on Kubernetes. It's, I don't know if all of it's open source yet, but uh, that gets rid of one of the flaws that someone might bring up about NiFi, and it is listed on this page are these repositories. These are kind of, there's no way around them. A flow file is as soon as I grab data, I need to have it somewhere. So we have a repository of those binaries. You know, any content you pull out of there, we need a repo for that. And that lineage provenance of every single step of the way, unless you want that in RAM, uh, most people want that durable, that's on a disk. So you can see the problem when you've got disk and compute together, something solved in Pulsar, in NiFi, the way that gets solved is with the Kubernetes edition, the storage is outside of the compute nodes. So if one goes down, the new one comes up, it gets you know connected to those uh, storage again. That is a flaw right now if you're not running on Kubernetes. Again, NiFi doesn't tend to crash, which is why I don't mind doing live demos with it. I've been doing live demos with uh, Apache NiFi since... 2016 or so have never had a crash you know i haven't seen a crash in production even though i had 100 clients this is really stable code that's been worked on a very long time so it's uh pretty cool that way it runs on uh, the jvm so this is a java app uh jdk 8 and 11 are currently supported obviously 
they'll have a new release with the uh, next version out of Java. You know, Java's been iterating pretty quickly. They'll wait till there's a long time supported one and then start adding that. Uh, since the JDK 11 one works, the other versions will probably work. They'll probably tweak it to be a little more performant. The performance is already pretty amazing, how much you can get done in something that is a fully uh, web application. There's a lot of different terms that I'm going to throw around before we start going through hands-on. And these are kind of important to understand what's going on. One of the most important ones is a flow file. I showed you that repository for that. The flow file is anything. It is an event. It is one record from a database. It's a thousand records from a database. It's an image. It's a PDF. It's whatever you brought into NiFi through any of the sources. And I'll show you the list of sources. It's big. <laughs> you know, it could be anything. It could be this picture. It could be I bring this in with a PDF. Ton of different stuff. So that's important. The other thing that makes NiFi unique, another differentiator from Camel, is the metadata that comes with it. It is fully uh, updatable. So I pull that content in. Maybe I don't want to change it. Maybe it's this picture. I want to take the picture, move it up to S3, but I want to put my own metadata around it. And maybe I'll run some deep learning through NiFi, look at this picture, grab some metadata, put that in what we call attributes. These are key value pairs that go along with the image. This kind of works like, uh, you know, HTML works, where you have uh, pages and the uh, headers. Same kind of idea. And you could just add as many as you want there. And then if that metadata is really important, I could pull all that out, build a flow file with it, and then store that. So your metadata isn't... Uh, something di different. It's first class data, which is pretty cool. Now, everything on the screen, it's called a processor. That's a Java component. Now there's a ton of them built in. There's also a ton of them that they don't put in the default distribution. This is because at this point, a full NiFi download is, is you know, over a gig. So that that's pretty big. And, you know, we don't want to take all of Apache's bandwidth. So there's a ton of uh, ones out there that you don't get in the full download, but they're all referenced from the uh, documentation. So if you want to download them or you're like, oh, I really need to process Hive or something else, you go look and it may be in the standard library you could download or it could be in the open source. I've written like 20 of them. If you've written a Spring Boot app, it's that easy. You know, there's a Maven archetype. You build it, gives you all the boilerplate, which actually will run, just do nothing. You add your own attributes, you add your own uh, logic, and it lets you get access to that full flow file and all those attributes, and you could change, do whatever you want with them, and then return what you want. Pretty straightforward to do it, and I'll, I'll link you some examples. Obviously, as an intro user, your first thing is going to be use what's out of the box, and that will that may serve you for years before you have to think about doing a custom processor. A controller, obviously, in the real world, I'm not just going to connect to something once and be done. There's a lot of things like databases, cloud resources, that you need something that will manage a connection pool, thing, keep things alive, reconnect. Those are controllers. Again, with the same as processor, you could write your own. Very easy to extend this. A connection, we'll see what makes uh, NiFi unique is it follows a flow through your, you know, data path. So I have a, a source and then from where it starts to where it ends is really up to you. There's a lot of possible connections and I've seen people connect one source to a hundred sinks. You know, it depends what you need to do. Now, the most important thing in NiFi when you're building any code is have a process group. I'll show you this. This is how I make everything modular, how I make things reusable, how I keep it together. Because if you look at my uh, workspace, there's a lot of stuff on there. So you can very easily get lost. You're like, ah, look at all this stuff. 
So we put it in a process group that is downloadable, that is version controllable, that is, you know, my main module. This could be thought of as a microservice or a module, a package, whatever you want to think of it as. This is your reusable group of stuff. Now, something that makes uh, NiFi unique is I told you I could pull in images. Well, yeah, NiFi for the first five or six years of its life, everything was a flow file, treats everything the same. You pick it up. Some things can work on it. Some can't. We don't really know what it is. We don't really give a difference if it's structured data, unstructured data, semi-structured data, binaries. Didn't matter. At some point, we the committers realized, well, sometimes you do care. Sometimes data is structured or semi-structured, and that gives you advantages, and there's certain things you want to do with it. Like if it's XML, CSV, JSON, Avro, Parquet, things like that, you want to be able to treat it as individual fields that have types, you know, like a table. And fortunately to an amazing Apache Project Calcite, I could do SQL on those as well. So this makes, uh, again, another thing that's uh, different from Camel. I can use SQL to convert between different file formats, pick out different fields, and do it with no code. You know, this line to the uh, left here pulls in XML, converts it to JSON, and does it with a SQL statement. I don't have to know what it looks like. That could be generic for any code you could possibly have. That's really cool. Whether you're using a schema or let NiFi infer it for you, pretty cool. Now, there's a ton of them, and they keep adding more. Again, like everything else, you, you're, you're missing something, like maybe you want Protobuf in there or GTFS, or you have your own uh, format. Write your own. The Reader API and the Writer API are pretty straightforward. As you see, there's a bunch in there. Grok is really cool. There's also one now that you can use it to look up another reader. So say I get uh, an attribute in that says, Tim, this data is going to be XML. I could dynamically choose that reader. So then I can make things even more generic. So I could have something that reads any type of file, converts it to any other type of file, then stores it in S3, make that a reusable component. I pass in a few parameters, and boom, it works for every use case. That's pretty nice. Again, it's as reusable as you want. A uh, feature I like is, again, if you're doing ETL, ELT, is being able to do uh, some caching or lookups. You know, you get data coming in. Since it's records, I know all the fields. So I can add to those fields. I can change the fields. I could do a lookup based on those fields and bring data back and change it. And I can have that used as a cache. I do that for uh, one of the uh, pharma companies needed to check. Uh, the U.S. has a daily med service. It gives you access to every uh, prescription medicine in the country, all the metadata about it. Sometimes it changes, sometimes it didn't. Before they were doing that manually, I could just cache it. It does the lookup. If it's there already, don't do anything. If it's not there already, do something, then add it to the cache. Here I used Apache Kudu, but I could have used Apache HBase, Mongo, I think Couchbase, a file. Lots of flexibility in pretty much everything in NiFi. Uh, one thing that's really cool that comes up a lot is uh, provenance. I mentioned this to lineage. This is probably more interesting than uh, people think. You know, while I'm trying to debug things, being able to go here and see it. And what's cool, if you haven't seen NiFi before, when you see something on the screen, that exact same thing is available through multiple mechanisms. The NiFi web service doesn't do anything fancy. It is a web UI that calls REST calls. Every single thing you do in NiFi is a REST call. So if I move something on the screen, that's a REST call. I show provenance, that's a REST call. So you open up your browser in developer mode, watch all those network calls, you'll get all the REST endpoints. You don't have to go through the docs to figure out what you want to look at. That is a cool feature. All those same things in provenance 
can be done with the command line interface. There's a really cool uh, command line toolkit for doing all your DevOps. Uh, there's charts and graphs for everything so you know what's going on. Again, all of that is a REST call or a command line interface. Makes it easy to monitor what's going on. And because it's a REST call, that means I can automate it with NiFi. So NiFi can monitor NiFi. I usually have another cluster I use just for monitoring. And it'll monitor what my other clusters are doing, see the metrics, look at their REST calls. And we can also do that with tasks. I'll show you that real quick. DevOps is really simple. You download the toolkit from the NiFi Apache site. And it just lets you, if you log, you might have to have a login. You can put that in a config file. Again, you can do it interactively or do it as a DevOps. This lets you do anything you want to do on the screen. Pretty straightforward. My friend David in the UK has made a Python wrapper for that. So if you uh, like to do your DevOps with Python, you could write code to automate all this if you want. Pretty straightforward stuff. I'll zoom through some of this and you'll get the slides later so we can get to the hands-on. You know, consuming from things. You can make NiFi be a listener. This, this is a very unique feature for NiFi, probably not in Camel. I can be an FTP listener, an SFTP, TCP, UDP, a REST endpoint, WebSocket endpoint. So you want to make a website that accepts any possible REST call. You can do that with one line in NiFi and just have NiFi automatically react to all the data coming in. Oh, yeah, they definitely can work together. I believe there's a way to call Camel directly. Obviously, we can integrate with something like JMS or Pulsar or Kafka or TCP IP or JDBC. Lots of different ways for NiFi to interact with pretty much any protocol. Uh, a common use case with NiFi is read some kind of source, do what it does best, clean things up maybe augment it, do updates, get that data clean, maybe call some other great Apache projects like Tika or MXNet or NLP, get things in a nice format, put it in some kind of message queue like Pulsar or ActiveMQ. And, you know, maybe that goes directly to storage. Maybe that goes to Flink SQL. Maybe that goes to some analytics tool. Maybe it goes to Apache Hue. And then at the end, you know, you have your applications pretty straightforward. I've got links to a lot of different things, but I think you're more interested in seeing NiFi. It's it's very visual, very visual. So seeing it makes a lot more sense. Uh, this is the main place here. I'm logged in. Uh, by default now, it is secure, which is a great feature. You know, so you can't put this out on the internet without at least a login. You really end SSL. So that's a good start. Anywhere you are, you could usually right click, give you an idea what's going on. Here it shows you the navigation so you could see kind of a zoomed out view of everything going on. You could zoom in, zoom out. Same, I could use browser zoom as well. This will tell me what I could do based on where I am. So if I click one of these process groups that I mentioned, here I could do some of the features right in this little panel or I could right click and manage it. You know, I can configure it, which is gives me access to all the features, what the name is, parameters. I didn't mention them. Parameters are a really nice uh, way to keep your code and you know all the data variables separate and you can apply them dynamically. Whether through the UI, through REST, through uh, do the command line interface, lots of ways to connect them. And there's some useful uh, process group wide settings here. Back pressure, I'll show you that in a minute, is between each step I have a queue. Again, a very nice feature NiFi has that I haven't really seen too many other places. So when you're going through a flow, if something stops or breaks, things can queue up there without being lost. You know, I don't have to push it to. Uh, Pulsar or another queue. Yeah, the back pressure queue thing is pretty cool. And this, this is, there's also a feature makes it more interesting is there you can enable a mode in NiFi that lets you use either an algorithm or machine learning 
again, extensible to monitor the queue size, to determine if it should be bigger or smaller. Obviously, if you're defining a queue somewhere that could take up space, maybe you don't want it uh, there, but uh, that's up to you. We mentioned those controllers. Here I can start and stop them from that entire group. And there's a ton of different ones. Uh, this little icon here gets me in to uh, change it. Here is settings. This one hasn't stopped, so I can't edit anything unless I stop it. Here's the different properties. You know, pretty easy. Probably should comment things. Uh, more important, like if I stop something, I don't know if I want to stop that one. More important is to give it a unique name. Like sometimes you just use the default name. Having a unique name will show up in the logs and in all the tasks and the metadata. So that way you'll be able to uniquely know every single control in a flow. So if I'm looking back to say, why did my data get messed up or lost? I can know exactly where it is. Otherwise you're gonna have to know this ID and as you see, these IDs are huge. <laughs> they're, they're unique, which is great, but uh, no one's remembering that. Where if I call this, uh, you know, step one encode schema Avro, okay, I know that's step one, and you could come up with your own naming conventions. That's very nice. Another nice feature here is this little book. Links you right to the NIFI docs. This is the same as the one on the Apache website. It, but it is for this version and it's local. So I don't need any network to be able to get this. And this has got the full docs for all the basic uh, controls and reporting tasks, plus links to all this kind of detailed uh, documentation, like getting started, all from right in the UI. Very helpful feature. Here you can see it gives me a problem because I'm missing something. Very helpful if you're not sure why something's not running. Uh, you could also delete something if it's not being used. I'm not using that one. Just delete it. Here is how I start and stop things. If you see an arrow, this means it's not defined here. It's defined somewhere else. And clicking it will bring you there. So this brought me somewhere else within NiFi where I can see where other things are running. Very nice way to navigate. You can also search. Like say I want to find where I'm using FTP. Type FTP. And then I can go there. Oh, here's where I'm doing a put FTP, and it sends me right to that code. If you look down the bottom, I've got the uh, you know standard breadcrumbs that I can navigate up from wherever I am. This is uh, some very messy code. Again, uh, making messy code happens. You can have it auto format things for you, or you could just format things nicer on your own, but you know, that's up to you. Uh, so we're back to the top here. This is the main level. If you're sharing NiFi with a lot of users, you're going to want to lock down what people can see and not keep everything on the screen. Maybe apply version control so you could move and take things off the screen. When I do a right click, I could download any code. This comes out as JSON, and then I could just import that somewhere else especially if I have parameters. We go into the parameters here. I can uh, export those separately so that when I want to move it somewhere, I can move the code and then apply parameters. So you move to production, different set of uh, parameters there for different database settings. Pretty straightforward. Again, that can be done all through REST or the command line. Pretty easy. Up here in that... Uh, hamburger menu. We've got links to a lot of things like what's running, what happened recently, what's disabled, any of the input ports, which you see I have a lot, any of the output ports, anything to remote ports. NiFi can communicate with other NiFi clusters and you can manually control that if you want. So you can decide how they talk. You could also talk with Pulsar or something else, but you know this, this is a pretty standard way to do that. And that'll be done over SSL. Any connections that I have out here, here you can see I've got a queue that's waiting to put to a database. And here I could see uh, some charts on that, what's happened recently. Again, all that can be accessed from uh, REST call if you want. If I'm curious to go, ooh, why is there, you know, why is there a 
you know, 13,000 things waiting here. I could just go there and I could see I left that there because I never configured Mongo because mainly I was pushing the solar. So if I want, I could just uh, empty that out or I can stop it, maybe reconfigure that. Maybe this uh, connection is too small. Maybe I want to name this connection. Send data to Mongo. You know, then I know where it is. I can see what the back pressure is. Maybe I want that a little bigger. Uh, maybe I want that load balanced. What happens when I move this from one node to a 25 node cluster? Maybe I just want to round robin that. Maybe I'm compressing, compressing things when I move it around. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm partitioning based on that attribute. Remember that metadata? So if I want things to stay on specific servers for some reason, I can do that. I could also keep it on the same node. I might not want it to go somewhere. I could also put in something like expiration if it's sitting around too long. Not too many people do that. I could also put a prioritizer in there. So I could decide, you know, how do I want data to go through this particular connection? You know, do I want uh, oldest? Do I want first in? Do I want to give uh, priority to certain data? So maybe I have it loading data constantly, but there's uh, alerts happening, uh, you know, once a day, boom, very easy to do. So uh, that makes that straightforward. And here, if I don't really want that data, well, let's see what it is first, which is nice. I can list what's ever in a queue and I can take a look at it, you know, look inside the content. And this is uh, an auto generated uh, JSON flow file that I built up from the metadata from a PDF that I analyzed. David, it's your book. You're on. You may be on. Uh, or I could download that flow file if I want to do something with it or maybe use it for testing. Or I can look at the metadata. This data, again, configurable how much you want, can be incredibly helpful when you're debugging or building your code because it is everything. It's a unique ID so I could track it through every log, track it through all the provenance that I'm ever going to have. And then on the other side, it's got, you know, all the metadata you expect. What's the file name, the size? Like this has been sitting in this queue for six days and I started processing it um, just a little bit over seven days ago. All the metadata that I have, most of this I added, you know, was pulled in by uh, certain programs. Here was the, uh, an inferred Avro schema from the uh, file. You know, different things we pulled out with different tools. All that metadata available to you makes it pretty uh, pretty cool there. So I have a lot of different code in here. Let's go to the next one. Counters. You can create your own counters if you want to watch things. You can also, there's a couple built-in ones, like how many records have I processed with all the update record statements? How many did I do, it, did I do with this named one? You get an idea. That's helpful. Again, everything is available from uh, from a REST call. Here are all the errors. Ooh, I've got a server down. Let's go see what that is. Yeah, I, I'm trying to access an FTP server. That is, there's a parameter. That is a, a device I've got sitting next to me. I did not restart that, so good point. What I was doing here is grabbing everything from that server, which is uh, NVIDIA Jetson box I have here, pointing to a directory. Again, that's the parameter for it. So if I need to change it. And uh, from there, I check. I could go recursive. I could follow sim links, you know, all those kind of things you might want to do. Connection timeouts, keep alive. And I just grab all the files there that have been there for at least 10 seconds and of this minimum size. Then I I update uh, the file name here, just to put the path and file name together. Uh, that is another feature of NiFi, being able to do expression language that lets you do some simple scripting. It's kind of like uh, Spring Spell. If you're curious on, uh, you know, how to do that, you know, this is the advanced version of that. If you have more conditions, you could just go into the docs and go to expression language. 
and see how you do all these things. Lots of examples here, as well as a lot of different uh, statements and functions that are built in. Some of them are pretty useful. Like if you look up here, substring, replace, you do a lot of encoding, decoding, JSON path, pretty cool stuff. Also, we have one for record path. Record path is awesome. This lets me do updates on any things within a record. So again, so I can make that ETL, ELT kind of stuff as records come in. And I don't have to do it onesie, twosie, kind of nice. So here, the next part of that list, get that actual file that we saw. And I can decide, you know, do you want to delete it and all those kind of things you might want to do with FTP. And then here is one of my custom processors. This one is one for doing uh, deep learning with Java. So that FTP server happened to have images. Again, like I said, NiFi does images. I don't know if Camel's too big on doing images. You know, maybe, maybe not. So I grabbed that image from that FTP server. Now I have an image here, which I think is the side of my head. And then I run it, see how it stopped. If I want to run it just once, so I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not sure if this processor is working or what's going on. It just ran once and it made a copy of the file. I put it in a local file system and then I was going to call uh, an MXNet server I have. This is the image, all the metadata. And these are the results of that uh, custom processor. It gave me information on, you know, everything I wanted on that uh, deep learning. So I'll put a bounding box on it over the classification results, all that sort of metadata. Again, I could take that metadata and I can send that to someplace like Slack. Like here I formatted a uh, Slack message with all that metadata about uh, that image. So, you know. Good way to do that. Could have sent that same data to, uh, you know, to wherever. Here I've got a Slack processor that's going to take the actual image and upload it to Slack. You know, the the amount of programming you can do is as much as you want it to do. Like here I have one. If I select all, I could start this entire, uh, this entire app here. Uh, this first one is sometimes you don't have a way you want to trigger something. Sometimes you want to send some hard-coded text. Sometimes you want to use it as a scheduler. This is a good way to uh, do integration testing or run things. Yeah, I didn't mention that before. That is not the only way to do it. Like I could get rid of that. And right here, it's got its own scheduler. So I could just set a cron schedule here to say run every minute. Or I could set a timer schedule that says, hey, run every 600 seconds. I could decide if I want to run on the whole cluster or on one node. Many times you only want to run on one node. Say I'm reading from an FTP directory. Might not be safe to read for uh, have 70 nodes doing that. What does a funnel do? That is a good one. Yeah, this guy over here is a funnel. This is to do pretty much what you think a funnel does. It brings everything together. Right now, these things are just waiting here because there's no error conditions. What you would typically do is once you have it funneled, maybe I'll send it to uh, an output port and then I could send it to another program. Or I could just leave it there if I'm just using it for debugging in here. Or I could send it to one processor. It makes it a, a good way to aggregate a bunch of things together. Now, it doesn't have to be errors. It could be anything that comes off a processor. If you look here under uh, this tab over here, you've got all the different relationships. I can, uh, yeah, if you know the EIP stuff, it's all in here. Uh, you could automatically terminate all the relationships if you want it to just stop. Maybe you just want to run something and stop, which is perfectly fine. Uh, here, what's pretty cool is I'm doing a REST call, but it's a REST call to download a zip. And I could unzip it, take all the files out, and then remember those record processors, convert XML to JSON. And here, since I know one of the fields, don't do it where the location field is empty. 
that's pretty generic code. Doesn't matter what that XML file is. If we look at that processor, infer the schema, do I want them array or not? And a couple of settings, that's it. I don't have to know what that XML file looks like. Because sometimes uh, the NOAA feed there doesn't give me consistent, uh, doesn't give me consistent results. So sometimes you might want to do something we have here as a validate record. If you have a known schema, that validate record will check against a schema to say, hey, it's valid or not. So if your data looks uh, messy, throw it away. Here I'm taking it, adding some metadata, splitting it out into individual JSON records. And here I'm slowing it down. Now there's many ways to slow things down. In NIFI, you might wonder why you might wanna slow it down. Here it's so I can watch the data. See, I do a refresh. I can see the data coming through. Makes for a better demo than 2000 records get processed in a second and you didn't see it happen. You're like, what happened with the code? You know, I can look at the data provenance and see, okay, that's the current uh, time for me in uh, New Jersey here. So I know I just processed it, but you know, it's nice to see the code just running. You might also have sinks that can't take a thousand rows a second. You know, they might not want that. So that's up to you if you want that kind of functionality. What's nice here at any time I can stop. You know, and you'll know you stop because things start queuing up. And again, those configurable queues, you send them to whatever you want there. Uh, obviously, Pulsar is a great place to queue things as well. But between each step, having that queue is helpful. So what happens if I set this queue and it only allowed 100 here? This would stop running and it would queue up here. And then when this gets full, it would queue up here. And it would work its way back up the chain till it got to its origin and then would stop making calls until you empty things out. And that you could be able to check if you went into uh, to our controller settings and I could set a reporting task that took a look at things going on. So say I wanna know what's going on with all this metadata. I could put in one of the reporting tasks like check the memory, check if queues are full, all those sort of things out there. There's a bunch of other reporting tasks and you can monitor what's going on with your system here. This is where we have access to the high level uh, functionality in NiFi. You can access to all the parameter contexts and edit them or delete them. You know, pretty much uh, pretty easy to navigate through what's going on. See what the latest version I'm running is, 114.0. There's probably going to be a new release soon since that was September. Probably should be soon. What's nice is when you want to add a source, here everything tells you what it is. You're just slowly navigating over. Click here, pull it over, drop it, and you can see everything here. If you've written custom ones like I have, you could look at the source of them. Maybe someone, you can limit this as well in security to say, well, only give people the Apache ones. I don't trust anyone else's, which isn't probably a bad idea. You know, my code isn't uh, as tested as maybe it should be, you know, because these are put together pretty quickly. But yeah, you pick uh, one of the processors here. Say like uh, here, I've got to put Twitter one, add it, and I can move it around where I want to do with it. And here I can configure it. You know, if this is the first one, this is not a first one because it needs a flow file. So it doesn't make sense for you to schedule this unless you want it to schedule when it uh, sends out the tweet, which maybe you do. You got to put in all those fun uh, connections to Twitter things in the message. And if you want to say where you pretend to live, you could put that in there. And if you wanted some really bad tweets, you could just... Uh, you know, generate a flow file, send it in, and once a minute, you know, yeah, this will send a lot of messages. And just put uh, uh, some text here, you know, this is my tweet. And, you know, every 10 seconds, it's going to tweet that out. Now, the thing you'll notice here is I didn't configure all that. That'll tell me what it is. If I have errors, I might want to do something with them. Now, I could send it out somewhere. Like that's a choice and that'll connect to uh, 
whoever wants to connect to it and i'll show you that or i can connect to another server and that will let uh, that go somewhere else or i could do maybe i don't believe there's an error no you know i know sometimes uh, twitter's doesn't work well so i'm going to just put a uh you know a connection here if it fails i'm going to have it retry a couple times you know that's configurable and then when it really fails i don't want to lose that tweet maybe i'll put it into a file so if it uh, really fails or you know i retried a couple times it didn't work let me put it in a file then this one i'd put where it is i'd also terminate this at some point you got to stop you know you you, you may want to go to uh infinity and beyond but you really should stop so they definitely not a great place to save your file uh so in retry flow file you by default it does three you want it more than that you can you could decide if you want to penalize the retreats you know that's up to you you could also decide uh you know what you want to do the different fail modes this makes it very easy to uh just retry a couple times now some of the processors will have their own retry and you'll see that here yeah, i don't need success there and so what's nice is you you never have to stop if you always go okay let me do something else let me send it somewhere else you always have those options but if you see if you have an output from something that one doesn't have an output does this one yeah, see, if it has one or multiple, it'll let you connect them up. So you could connect between the different uh, modules, which is very cool. That's up to you. Uh, what else is interesting here? I'm looking to see if I see any more questions. Hopefully, we're able to differentiate that NiFi and Camel are a little different. But, yeah, the great thing with Apache is the more things you have. Uh, I don't have Camel here. I thought I had Mule. I thought I had one of the connectors here. I'm trying to think. Yeah, what's nice is you could search through there. If you have an idea what you're searching for, like if you're looking for Amazon stuff, you look at Amazon. You know, I know there's a spring connector. If there isn't one, you know, maybe I go through JMS. You know, I could go through Pulsar, Kafka, TCP IP. You, know, you get the idea. There's lots of different ways to connect different uh, projects. You know, whatever makes sense for you. There is a, a lot of different ones in here, uh, including some of the ones that I put in there. Do we have any more specific questions? I know we're getting close to time, and I want to make sure we leave time for the next session. And I will post all these slides, make sure they're tweeted out, and I'll put them in Hoppin. So if you're interested in them, They'll be there. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out. I have this uh, GitHub that has links to most of the things you'll want. The summary of my talks will be up here. That includes the NiFi, uh, the more advanced one, which uh, goes in a little deeper on NiFi. But you know, you can really get started pretty easy. Figure out one source. Grab that source, you know, maybe it's a list, maybe it's a get. Find the thing you want to start with, grab it, connect it with a line, go to the next thing, and then, you know, maybe do uh, do some processing, maybe convert it, maybe add uh, some data to the records. Pretty straightforward. And then put it somewhere, you know. Uh, and it, this could be somewhere generic so you can reuse that code. So this one that gets weather data, that's generic. You know, this one that validates, I can make this generic. And it just takes anything and maybe pass in the uh, name of the topic. Uh, and uh, you pass in the connection and you're set to go. Well, thank you. Let me uh, wrap it up and I'll uh, put this all online. Thanks for joining. I hope... Uh, we answered your questions. I hope I gave you that little bit of difference with uh, with uh, Camel there. Thank you. This was a very interesting talk, very complete, a lot of content. I, I really loved it. Very cool. Thank you. So.
The next talk is in five minutes. It should be already open and we have to change rooms, remember? And if you have any other questions for Timothy, I guess he's able to answer them by message. No problem. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you.